Here's my favorite part of my favorite class of the semester right now. Let's find a series for one over one minus X squared. And let's do it in three different ways. And we'll see that we get the exact same answer every time. And this is fun. First way, use the formula we've just been using in the last 15 minutes. Write this as one plus negative X to the negative two power. The P now is negative two. And the thing playing the role of X is negative X. So we get one plus P times X, negative two times negative X, two minuses will make a plus, plus P times P minus one over two factorial times the thing playing the role of X is negative X quantity squared plus P times P minus one times P minus two over three factorial times the, the thing playing the role of X quantity cubed, etc. Simplify, get one plus two X. Look at this term here, negative X quantity squared is just the same as X squared. Negative two times negative three is positive six divided by two factorial. Six divided by two is three. Here, negative X cubed is negative X cubed. But then we have three more negative signs, three more negative numbers that are being multiplied. So I actually still get a positive. Two times three times four. It's like one times two times three times four. It's like factorial, four factorial divided by three factorial. It's four. Very nice pattern there, huh? I guess the next one would be 5x to the fourth and then 6x to the fifth. Is that right? And it converges if the absolute value of x is less than negative one, which is the same as saying the absolute value of x itself is less than one. Is this right? Let's try confirming the answer in two other ways. Let's think of this function as one over one minus X quantity squared, which is okay to do, right? Square fraction, you square the top and the bottom, one squared is one. But wait a minute, that's our old friend, the geometric series, sum of a geometric series. What, am I gonna square a series? Yes, I am. Are you kidding me? How can I foil? These are not binomials. They're not trinomials. They are infinity nomials. Infinomials, yeah. Foil doesn't work, but what does work? Here's what works, but it's hand wavy. Ready for more hand wavy, but fun stuff. Take the first term in the first factor, one, and multiply it times every term on the right. One times everything is that everything. Then go to the second term on the left, x, and multiply it times every term on the right increase the power of x by one in each case. Put the answer underneath the first answer and line up like terms. x times one is x, put it under the first x. x times x is x squared, put it under the first x squared. x times x squared is x cubed, etc. Now go to the next term, x squared, and multiply it times everything on the right. x squared times one is x squared, put it under all the other x squareds. See where this is going? X squared times X is X cubed. Put it under the other X cubes, et cetera. Go to the next one, X cubed times everything. It starts out X cubed times one, et cetera, et cetera. Add all these up. 
one plus two X plus three X squared plus four X cubed, etc. We did it. Is this valid? Seems really hand wavy. We are, it's an infinite series of infinite series. Can that possibly be made rigorous? Yes, it can be. We're not going to though. That's for a real analysis class. Although to tell you the truth, when I teach real analysis, I don't take the time to even make it rigorous myself. It can be, but it feels crazy. Newton, Leibniz, Euler, Bernoulli's, they all did this kind of stuff to their heart's delight, not worrying about whether it was rigorous or not, to tell you the truth. It was only made rigorous. So they lived in the 1600s and 1700s. This was only made rigorous in the 1800s. Let's do it one more way. Same problem, one more way. What other way could we possibly do? How about the fact that this function here, if you've worked with it enough, you realize it's the derivative of this function. Think about it, differentiate that. Bring down the negative one, negative one, one minus X, subtract one from the exponent negative two exponent times chain rule, another negative one. Negative one, two negatives one make a positive one and we have a negative two power. This is correct. But wait a minute. One minus X to the negative one power is the same as one over one minus X. And that's the sum of a geometric series. We integrated term by term. Was it Monday or was it last Friday? Now we're differentiating term by term. And yeah, the next term would be four X cubed. Same answer. We did it three different ways. Same answer. We didn't prove any of these methods. We derived them, so to speak. We're not rigorously proving that you can differentiate term by term. We're just trusting that you can. I did show you Monday or last Friday, I forgot, that you can integrate term by term. Let's quickly review that. The series for one over one plus X squared We'd ultimately integrate to find the series for arctangent. Let's remind ourselves of how that was done. This was a geometric series. Turned out to equal this. As long as the absolute value of X is less than one. Arctangent of X, same as inverse tangent of X is an integral of one over one plus X squared. So integrate the infinite series, put all that in there. Integrate term by term. Don't forget your plus C. I am integrating in my head here at the moment. I'm integrating this thing up here. But what should C be? Use the fact that our tangent of zero is zero. And therefore, if you plug in zero on the right side, it implies C must be zero. So in fact, just this part equals the arc tangent. We also said that that happens to be true even at the endpoints, amazingly enough. With this series back up here, we did not get equality at the endpoints. It was an open interval. But amazingly, this one works 
even at the endpoints, though that takes proof that we're not doing. It's a closed interval of convergence. The radius of convergence is still the same, r equals one, but now we include the endpoints. And this was the one that we saw that if we plug in x equals one, we get a series for pi over four because r tangent of one is pi over four. Here's a series that converges to pi over four. And therefore, if we multiply it by four, the resulting series converges to pi, though very slowly. Here's another example like that. A series for natural log. Now, if I was after a series for natural log of x, I would not want to center it at zero because it's a vertical asymptote at x equals zero, right? The y-axis is the vertical asymptote for the natural log function. So you would not want to center it at zero. Centering it at one is better. Alternatively, you could take the natural log function, natural log of x, and shift the graph to the left by one unit to get natural log of one plus x. And that has a vertical asymptote at negative one, and you can expand it at zero. How am I going to find it? Not by computing derivatives, though I could. It's not too bad. I'm going to find it a more fun way. I'm going to integrate one over one plus x. which is the sum of a geometric series. This geometric series. So it ends up being pretty similar to the arctangent example, except that we get all powers of x, except the zeroth power, instead of just odd powers of x, like we did with our tangent. So this becomes c plus x minus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3 minus x to the fourth over 4 plus x to the fifth over 5 minus x to the sixth over 6 plus dot, dot, dot. The c once again ends up being 0 because natural log of 1 is 0. And one is one plus zero. So if you replace x with zero in the series, it implies c is zero. So just this part equals the natural log of x. Natural log of one plus x. And that, it turns out, happens to be true, not on an open interval, not on a closed interval, but a half open, half closed interval. You include, it turns out, the right endpoint, but not the left endpoint. I mean, it makes sense to not include the left endpoint, negative one, because there's where the vertical asymptote is for natural log of one plus x. But the right endpoint, it works as well, because you could use the alternating series test. And if you do substitute in x equals one, what you get is natural log of two, one plus one is two equals this series when you plug in one. One minus a half plus a third minus a fourth, our old friend, the, the alternating harmonic series. We already saw that was natural log of two. Is this a proof? No. It's a derivation or maybe a plausibility argument. It's not a rigorous proof, but uh, we're happy with it. You can still say it's fun. So what we're after in this course, right, is fun. That's what I'm after, it seems like. I, know. I do think it is fun. This is my idea of fun. I know it's not most people's idea of fun. I hope you say it's a lot more fun, perhaps, than using the comparison test, for example, or maybe even the ratio test, though the ratio test is maybe moderately fun. OK, I hope it's more fun than the comparison test, at least to you. It is amazing seeing it all work. That's the amazing thing about it.
10 class, let's do something else fun. <laughs> let's divide infinite series. We already multiply them. Why not divide them? How about the tangent function? It's sine of x divided by cosine of x. Use the series for sine and cosine to see if you can find the series for tangent. We did the series for sine at the first part of the class today. And the series for cosine. It's like you've got two infinite polynomials. Maybe we should use long division. And yes, that's what you want to do. With your long division symbol, put the numerator underneath. I will go ahead and simplify the factorials. I'm going to be satisfied with three non zero terms. The hard part about doing it this way, though, is that it's difficult to see the pattern for the answer. But we will be okay with it. What do you do? Ask yourself, look at the lowest powered terms. What do I multiply one by to get x? I multiply it by x. So the series for tangent of x starts out x. Then take that, multiply times everything here, and we'll put it down below. x times 1 is x. x times minus 1 half x squared is minus 1 half x cubed. x times 1 24th, x to the fourth is 1 24th, x to the fifth, etc. Then subtract. The x's cancel. Oh, well, we got to deal with fractions here. Negative 1 sixth plus 1 half. Negative one sixth plus one half common denominator of six becomes negative one plus three over six is two sixth or one third plus one third x cubed. With the next one, we got 100, one over 120 minus one over 24, get a common denominator of 120. And it becomes this. That's negative four over 120, which reduces to negative um, 1 30th. I think everything's right. For the next term, what do I multiply one by to get 1 third x cubed? I multiply it by one third x cubed. Now take that and multiply every term. One, time, one third x cubed times one is one third x cubed. One third times negative x cubed times negative one half x squared. So minus one sixth x to the fifth, et cetera. Subtract, get zero. One more fraction to deal with. Negative one thirtieth plus one sixth common denominator of 30 becomes negative one plus five over 30, so four over 30, which is two fifteenths. So this becomes plus two fifteenths x to the fifth, etc. And that's good enough to give me my last non zero term that I want plus two fifteenths x to the fifth, etc. Well, it looks like, if I've not made a mistake, the first three non-zero terms of the Taylor series for the tangent function centered at zero series tan x. I need to the fifth degree though, so I need to put a five there. Looks good. What's the interval and radius of convergence? It turns out if you are able to figure out the pattern of the coefficients, you can prove that the radius of convergence is pi over two, and the interval of convergence is from negative pi over two to positive pi over two, which I hope makes some sense because that's where the vertical asymptotes of the tangent function are near zero, negative pi over two and positive pi over two. All right, have a good long break. See you in a week.